some might say the most contentious haunted house in England. We've heard from Alan Murdy, who outlined the details of the case. The rectory being built in the 1860s by the Reverend Henry Bull, and subsequently lived in by his family, which included 14 children, which required that the rectory be increased in size by the addition of various wings and extensions down the years. I consider myself quite fortunate. Um, I've visited the site a number of times. Um, I, like we heard from Anne and Winsper a little, um, a little while ago, I also proudly have another brick from Borley, um, legally um, obtained at exactly the same time, courtesy of the owner of the property that now stands on the site. And uh, as Anne said, he, he allowed us to, well, he himself chiselled and bolstered the bricks out of the foundations of the rectory. And uh, using plans of the rectory um, overlaid onto the modern landscape, we were able to ascertain quite quickly and readily that the brick had come from the area of the drawing room. Now, the drawing room at Borley, as built by the Reverend Henry Bull, contained a notable feature, that of a bricked-up window. The window uh, in, the drawing, in the dining room, drawing room, was bricked up, and as the story went, to prevent the nun, the ghostly nun, from peering in at the window as the family at the meals or sat um, doing what families do, or presumably watching The X Factor or whatever the, 19, uh, the 1870s equivalent of The X Factor might be. Uh, so that's another proud possession and it sits alongside currently the world's only scale model of Borley Rectory in its entirety. Uh, unfortunately it is far too big a um, model to transport for this event it would have been nice uh, but it was not to be the case this is a an o scale so 143rd scale replica uh, handmade model of Borley rectory and it's it, it's detailed right down to the in, the internal parts uh, so perhaps for a future podcast but we've heard a little about, about Borley and we've touched upon some of the things that took place that price wrote about in his book um, the two books he wrote. We've also heard from Anne that perhaps Price wasn't everything that he appeared to be. Now, I grew up as a child in the 60s as a fan, a fanboy of Harry Price. I read the, his books. I first came across him in the Guinness Book of World Records, which is quite a, a place to find a ghost hunter. It mentioned in a, in a brief paragraph the most haunted house in England and contained a very small faded black and white photograph of Borley Rectory. And a paragraph underneath said that it had been investigated in the 1930s by Harry Price. I took myself up to the local library, found a copy of the book and I was immediately hooked. Price was the first the primary investigator. A gentleman we heard from Alan, we heard from Anne, to which we owe a great deal as, in, as modern 21st century investigators. Some of the techniques that he pioneered we use to this very day. He wrote the very first set of instructions, the book, you've heard it called The Blue Book. It was called The Blue Book simply because it was printed cheaply. It had a blue cardboard cover. And there were only 50 or 60 copies ever printed. Um, there were perhaps even you know, less than a handful in existence in the world to this day. They were cheaply printed, they were a set of guidance notes for those he recruited for the year-long investigation of Borley when he rented it from 1937 to 1938. But every time Harry Price's name is mentioned, every time Borley is mentioned, it comes with a caveat. The controversial Harry Price. Harry Price, he was flawed. He was a fake. He threw the bricks at Borley. In fact, in a modern, fairly recent television portrayal in the UK, Price was described thus as a failed psychic who turned to uh, ghost hunting, um, creating fraudulent ghosts in order to take money from the gullible. Price has Google Harry Price's name. 
well, at the end of the at the end of the podcast, go on to Google, Google Harry Price's name, look at what they say about Price. He, that he was a charlatan, that he was a fake, that he made up everything at Borley, that nothing you can read about Price you can take reliably. But is that the real Harry Price? Is that the man who really did investigate Borley? Well, I'm going to take you back a little bit before, before we talk more about Price's reputation. Price had, from an early age, an interest in the paranormal. He came into it via an interest in magic and conjuring. He, as a schoolboy, uh, had seen the magician, the great Sequa. Now, this was a travelling show, um, a snake oil salesman, a magician, a, an ent a street entertainer. And Price was immediately captivated by Sequa and p fascinated by magic and illusion. Later, that interest spread into an interest in the paranormal because Price realised that many of the tricks that were being used by the mediums, the stage mediums, were exactly the same that he knew as a magician himself. And not just an amateur magician. Price was, in fact, um, very high ranking in the magic circle, the British magic circle, which is the, the, the governing body to which all magicians aspire to belong. In 1925, Price developed his interest um, further. He founded the National uh, Laboratory for Psychical Research, a direct competitor, a scientific organisation. The National Laboratory for Psychical Research, with its headquarters in London, with the sole aim and objective of objectively and scientifically studying all forms of paranormal phenomena and claims. These included the testing of mediums. He tested many uh, famous mediums. He tested the famous Schneider brothers, Rudy and Willy Schneider, who, uh, who were from uh, Germany, from the, in fact, the same town as Adolf Hitler was born. Um, when, when Price encountered what he considered to be genuine mediumship, Price was very forthright in coming forward and saying that, in his opinion, he was di he was able to show, under good good degrees of control, that the medium had done something significant and challenging. Price also devised many controls. He had electric gloves and electric slippers that the medium and all of the sitters in the seance would wear, arrayed to a bank of lights on the wall that would show if anybody moved a hand or foot. The mediums were under very tight control. He used advanced techniques that we consider in the 21st century to be the stuff of ghost adventures and the stuff of ghost hunters. Infrared film photography and infrared... Um, he used three-dimensional photography. He used a number of uh, devices which he himself invented and built. The telekinetoscope was one. This simple device in which the medium was invited to cause, a, or invited by uh, inviting the spirit, to cause a light bulb to illuminate by pressing a button. But the button was protected by a glass cover. And underneath the glass cover, the button was protected by a soap bubble. So first of all, they would have to penetrate the glass, the glass dome, and then they would have to activate the button without bursting the soap bubble which protected it. When somebody pointed out to Price that the cable could be interfered with, he used armour-plated cable in the telekinetoscope. When the Rhine Institute invented the famous Zener cards, these are the famous cards that, that everybody interested in parapsychology or even mediumship will be aware, the star, the wavy line, the triangle, the square and the, and the, the seahorse. Uh, the, these five famous symbols, Price obtained a copy, a, a pack of these Zener cards. They were invented by the psychologist Carl Zener for the Rhine Institute in order to test the latent ability of some people to precognitively know which symbols were going to come. Price realised that, that the deck had been made and it was see-through, that in the right lighting conditions you could see through the cards. 
So he went back and he redesigned his own set of telepathic cards, which used a dazzle background pattern, uh, and which he had made by a British games manufacturer, uh, on thicker card and with this dazzle pack uh, back on them, in order for uh, to improve upon the Zener cards, and indeed resulted directly in an improvement of the Zener cards. So it was no no surprise that Price was called upon by the newspaper after they had been contacted by the Reverend uh, Smith about this most haunted house, this rectory in which all of this stuff was taking place. Price was, Price was almost the first person that they would pick up the phone. He was the country's acknowledged leading experts on ghosts and the paranormal. He had a research laboratory that was well equipped. It had a photographic dark room. It had an engineering facility. It had seance rooms. It had one of the most extensive libraries on the subject in the country. Incidentally, Price had spent his entire career from founding of the NLPR up to the, the commencement of Borley in the 1930s, um, the commencement in the 1920s, uh, uh, I'm sorry, trying to convince academic universities in the United Kingdom and later in America and in Europe to take the subject seriously, that this needed to be the subject of serious academic research. He offered not only his entire library on a permanent loan basis to any academic organisation that would take this or set up this research establishment, he offered funds. And when they didn't come forward, he himself decided to take uh, and set up his own um, organization. So Price was the logical person to investigate. But Price didn't actually do very much investigating. Because what, what one of the problems with Price is he had a heart condition. He'd had a heart condition he'd been diagnosed from quite an early age with, with angina. He had a weak heart. And it wasn't... He realised also that if his uh, investigation was to have credibility, then he would have to call upon independent researchers. Also, he realised that he was a very busy man. He was much in demand from the media. And he couldn't devote his entire attention to spending any, an entire year within the walls of Baldy Rectory. And so he recruited a team of investigators, one of whom, we've heard his name mentioned earlier, was Sidney Glanville. Now, Glanville was the lead investigator for Baldy Rectory. And there is not one single sceptic, there is not one single criticism of Glanville by anybody and in fact, Glanville's work at Borley remains as, uh, on, f on behalf of Price, on behalf of the National Laboratory for Psychical Research, remains as a landmark for psychical investigation. Harry Price himself, in his books, stuck, commences with, no living man is as well qualified to write this account as S.H. Glanville. The contents of the locked book were compiled by my chief official observer, Mr. S. H. Glanville. If all other existing records of Borley were to be destroyed and only the lock book saved, it would form a complete history of the haunting. It will forever be a model for psychical researchers as to how a report is to be prepared. Unfortunately, it is the locked book that's missing, that's gone. And we're left only with the other output, the other side of Harry Price to judge the man. Price was, to our 21st century eyes, very modern, very forward thinking because he was, he wanted to push his agenda. He wanted the academic mainstream to take on board the need and the necessity to study the paranormal, for psychical research to be recognised as a legitimate area for science to study. There had been scientists who had been interested in studying this, this area before, Sir Oliver Lodge, Michael Faraday. Many, many scientists had studied this, but no university had taken this as a legitimate 
course of study. They hadn't set up a, a, a department, there had been no chair in parapsychology or, or indeed any para subject. And Price was very, very keen to do this. And he realised that if you want to exert pressure on anyone, you need, to infl you need to get the public on side. And to get the public on side, you need to work the media. Modern, modern investigators, you see them on television, they work the television, they work the social media, they work the, the, all of the media opportunities in order to promote themselves and to promote their products. Price was doing exactly the same thing. Today, we don't think of that in, as unusual in any way. Back in the 1920s and 1930s, particularly in Britain, it was considered to be a, a very ungentlemanly thing to do. So Price left us two legacies. Price left us The Most Haunted House in England, his first book, and he left us The End of Borley Rectory, the second book on, on Borley, a number of articles which he did for newspapers, um, several interviews that he did. Um, and he was in the process of writing a third book on Borley when he was found dead in his study at Arran Bank in Pulborough uh, in 1948, at the tender age of 67. So the judgments made against Price are based upon his written output. They were based in part on the locked book because it did exist at that time. In fact, it still might exist today. And the work of one man. Now, this man, Trevor Hall, um, I have a, there we are, this is the gentleman. Trevor Hall is um, described as a British author, a surveyor, a skeptic of paranormal phenomena, and that one who made controversial claims regarding early members of the Society for Psychical Research. His books caused a heated controversy within the parapsychology community. He was born in Wakefield, England, and served in the British Army during World War II. He had a deep interest in magic and a deep interest in mystery, and was a student of psychical research at Trinity College, Cambridge, between 54 and 56. He had an extensive knowledge of conjuring and magic, um, and he wrote a number of books, all of which were critical, um, in the large part, when they relate to psychical phenomena. His first book, uh, The Spiritualists, or one of his early books on The Spiritualists, uh, accused the psychical researcher and eminent um, chemist, William Crookes, of having an affair with the medium and just plain fraud. Um, not content with that, he then turned his um, pen towards Edmund Gurney, another founding member of the Society for Psychical Research, uh, laying the claims of that Gurney, um, had, amongst the other things, after discovering f um, certain frauds, had then committed suicide. A charge that was strongly contested by Gurney's biographer and, and other researchers subsequently. One of the most famous mediums in the world, Daniel Douglas Hume, the man who floated out of one window and floated back into another window, was next on Trevor Hall's uh, list of um, criticisms and critiques. Hall asserted that the medium had invented his aristocratic background and concluded that the alleged levitation um, of Hume at Ashley House never happened as all the eyewitness reports contradict each other and all Hume did was to step across a gap of four feet between the two uh, windows. Now Hall was the junior partner in the three people who were commissioned uh, effectively by the Society for Psychical Research to re-examine uh, the case of Borley Rectory. This was posthumously following the death of Harry Price. And in fact, in the introductory note to the book that they subsequently published, and it was also proceedings by the Society for Psychical Research, the, this report is the result of an inquiry conducted by Dr. E.J. Dingwall, Mrs. K.M. Goldney, and Mr. Trevor H. Hall at the invitation of the Council of the Society for Psychical Research. And so, armed with 
their research notes. The three set to work and produced a book that was damning from the first page to the very last about Price and the Borley investigation. Now, the book made many accusations. I'm not going to even bother to go through all of the accusations in the book. You can get a copy. Um, but let's just compare what Price was actually doing. They were basing a lot of their accusations on a book, The Most Haunted House in England, and the second book, The End of Borley Rectory, which were written for public consumption. These were not intended to be investigation reports. I've written plenty of investigation reports where you, you detail the measurements, you detail who was present, what happened, what transpired, and I've written many public consumption versions of the same investigation notes. And they're very different beasts of very different character. What you're trying to convey in one is a sense of the overall investigation. You give edited highlights and snippets of, of information. Because if you've, any of you have ever read an investigation report, it's probably about as dull as a set of tax returns in reality. Uh, and would never have been a seller. Price realised that he, if he was going to get the public on side to promote his cause for promoting psychical research as a legitimate branch of scientific study, he was going to have to get people reading his books, working the BBC, promoting the investigations um, and the legitimacy of the science. So he would do things like, he did the world's first ever live ghost hunt, which he did in 1936 from Mepham, um, another haunted manor in Kent. Uh, he, he, he was not uncomfortable about playing the media. When we heard from Alan earlier today, uh, we heard about how he took 800 reporters up a mountain at Brocken in Germany with a goat to turn it into a young boy, a young handsome Adonis. Now Price knew from the off that this was doomed to fail. It, the, boy, the goat wasn't going to turn into anything but what it was was a goat. What Price was showing was science needs to look at this to test this claim because the claim was if you do these certain incantations and certain spells in a certain order, then a goat will turn into a boy. Well, Price knew that was rubbish. But you can't just simply say, that's rubbish. I will take a goat, I will take it to the place where people say, I will do the incantations, I will do the spells, and oh, look, it's a goat. But Hall, Goldney, Dingwall, and subsequent others have said that this, this was just ridicule that Price had conducted this crazy publicity stunt. Yes, he did. He did it as a publicity stunt to demonstrate the fallacy, the, the fallacy and folly of, I've invented a new word, fallacy. The fallacy of not exploring the claims that are being made, not taking these things at their face value. Trevor Hall, let's come on to, the, to this gentleman again, this surveyor, this psychical researcher, this man of um, interested in magic, interested in conjuring. Trevor was a partner in the writing uh, trio who were involved in the, the haunting of Baldy Rectory, um, produced in 1950, 55, 56 at the behest of the Society for Psychical Research. Now, the people recognised that the book was flawed from the start and in fact, in the 1960s, uh, the Society for Psychical Research did redress that somewhat with the Hastings Report, which was published in 1969, where Robert Hastings re-examined the evidence of the first inquiry and pointed out that it, it too was deeply flawed. Not that withstanding, though, Hall seemed to have a major problem with Harry Price. They had never met they had, they had moved in different circles. And yet, for some reason, Hall has this serious problem. I don't know whether he, he, he slept at night uh, or fell asleep at night without thinking about what he could do to Harry Price. Because he, he wrote another book with Eric Dingwall, um, 
called Four Modern Ghosts, which, he, uh, which was published in 1958, and in which he devotes an entire chapter to Harry Price and an attack on the Rosalie case. This is the case where Price regretted publishing, uh, or was said to regret publishing it, where he visited a house and where he believed he saw the apparition of a young girl. Now, as an investigator myself of many years' experience, Price's acknowledgement of perhaps it was best not to publish is more based on the fact that what Price experienced that night may have just been so astounding that it doesn't bear telling properly because it was done without the controls that Price would have liked. I too have been in situations where astounding things have happened and the next day when the sun comes up, you can't rationalise it very well. And any attempt to explain what took place just makes it seem ever more ludicrous. And that's probably more why Price had decided it was a bad idea to publish. But nonetheless, in Four Modern Ghosts, Trevor Hall spends an entire chapter having a go at the Rosalie case. He still couldn't put Harry Price out of his mind. And in, in 1965, he wrote A New Light on Old Ghosts which was basically Trevor Hall having yet another go at Price. Um, on and on he went through and nut through his books. Hall also then started to bring in um, Paul Tabori. Paul Tabori was, after Price's death, um, given the job of being Price's official literary executor and had written an earlier biography in 1950 of Harry Price. But Hall launches... Um, an attack against Tabori and Peter Underwood, another respected British investigator and chairman of the Ghost Club, saying that they were sycophantic towards Price and that they, they were just copying what Price had left. Finally, in 1978, Trevor Hall produced his definitive work. The work is his cathartic search for Harry Price, a book in which he finally laid bare all of his charges against Harry Price. The book was described by many um, as the most vitriolic, vile, ill-thought-out attack on one person that they've ever had the um, misfortune to read. Those that, that, that uh, Hall had spoken to during the writing or the research for the book um, started to distance, distance themselves from anything to do with Hall and, and the book itself and his charges against Price. He laid bare that Price, Price's father may have had uh, a relationship with his mother when his mother was uh, considered to be, I suppose, a minor, that she was 14 or 15 years old at the time and that this, this would have caused some scandal. Now, Price Keen, Harry Price, um, who was keen, as I said before, to promote the idea of psychical research as a serious academic pursuit, would be very well aware of the British class system that operated in the 1920s and 1930s. He would be very well aware that one of the things that would not help him at all was his standing as uh, the son of a mere travelling salesman. So it wouldn't be too fantastical, particularly as the books were written for the popular consumption, for Price to maybe want to bury his past a little bit, to maybe want to bury that little bit of scandal. I think many families have got skeletons in their closet that have been a generation or two swept aback and we don't talk about. So. Price did possibly cover up his past, or cover up the past of his father and the scandal that existed. A scandal that we don't think of that significant today, but I, I know my, my grandparents' generation, um, they would have thought of this as... This was an era where girls were sent away for being pregnant. Uh, they were sent away to have the child secretly and it was never spoken about again. 
So if indeed Price, if, if, if Hall had been, uh, is correct and Price's father did have a, a relationship with Price's mother when she was uh, of a very young age, that resulted or would have resulted in a potential scandal. Price would certainly never have revealed that and would have actively pursued um, whatever lines he could do to keep that, that past buried. Now on to Trevor Hall himself. <clears throat> um, Alan Wessencraft was the curator of the Harry Price Library um, and was asked in 2000 uh, as a curator of the Harry Price Library to write a foreword to a, a book on Borley Rectory. And he chose not to write very much about Borley Rectory, but to write quite a great deal about Trevor Hall. Now, I have a number of private letters from Alan Westencraft to other researchers um, that go into far stronger language than he uses when describing Hall uh, in the foreword of uh, Edward Babb's book on Borley Rectory. I have never met anyone who had a good word to say for Trevor Hall. I enclose a copy of the memorandum that proves conclusively that Hall obtained possession of the locked book by a disgraceful and outrageous act, i.e. he stole it. And in fact, um, I just want to uh, just get to the right section because... What, in, what, it, what transpired is, under the pretext of uh, Glanville loaning Hall the book, Hall then claimed that Glanville had bequeathed him the locked book. This is the definitive record of the investigation of Borley Rectory. What did Hall do with it? He sold it. He sold it to a book dealer and it ended up in America. We don't know where it is. So if anybody's watching this podcast and you have Sidney H. Glanville's The Locked Book, The Investigation Reports of Baldy Rectory, you would be doing psychical research one huge favour by, by um, re-releasing the information that's contained within it because that is the actual account of Baldy. Within that book, there are extracts of it that do survive. For example, in October of 1951... Uh, there was an edition of American Fate magazine published in which Sidney Glanville himself, who was Price's chief official observer at Borley uh, during the tenancy of 37 and 38, um, gives a concise history of the hauntings and describes his visits to Borley um, and the, the, the visits of other investigators. Now, at no point does Hall or any of the subsequent sceptics of Price ever point a finger towards Glanville. They speak of him only in the very highest esteem, that he was a man of impeccable credentials, that this was a man who is beyond question. So let's look at some of the things that Glanville mentioned about the Borley Rectory case. Now, we've heard, and you will read on the internet, that it was all the fantastic work of Harry Price, that he created it, that he was caught by Charles Sutton, the newspaper reporter, with pockets full of very big pockets full of bricks and throwing them around, um, around the place and creating this stuff because he was an amateur conjurer and uh, with also accusations of ventriloquism um, at the time as well. However, Price is called in in, in the 1920s, in 1929, by the Reverend Guy Eric Smith. The Reverend Smith cuts, writes to the newspaper as an act almost of desperation, saying that him and his wife are at their wit's end. All hell has been breaking loose at this rectory that they're living in, and can somebody come and help? What Smith was probably after is investigators from the SPR coming along, the newspaper immediately contacts the authoritative figure of Harry Price, and Price turns up. But Price didn't start it. These events had been happening since the building had been built. Price didn't give the rectory the name of the reputation of the most haunted house in England. He heard that from somebody in the village when he arrived um, to conduct to commence the investigation. He asked for a taxi to be taken up to Borley, and the taxi driver said, oh, you mean the, the rectory, the most haunted house in England? The, pro the title was given to Price by a, by a cabbie. 
so we heard about the phantom nun being seen on the lawn of the rectory, which Price um, gives an account of in the books. Glanville gives a, a, an accurate account from his interviews with the Bull sisters. Miss Ethel Bull and her sisters Frieda and Mabel, the daughters of the Reverend Henry Bull, were born in Borley Rectory. They have assured me that on a June afternoon, when they were returning from a garden party and had just entered the rectory garden, they all three simultaneously and quite clearly saw the figure of a nun walking slowly on the other side of the lawn. They were astonished as, although the apparition had been seen many times at dusk, they had never before seen it in daylight. Miss Ethel Bull ran into the house to bring a fourth sister to see the phenomena and fortunately found her immediately. All four sisters watched the grey figure walk slowly across the lawn as she neared the trees which bounded the lawn. The nun gradually faded and disappeared from the sight. During the past 50 years, more than 20 people have reported seeing this apparition. One man, a guest of the Bulls, who knew nothing whatever of the story, came into the house to ask the rector about the nun he had seen walking in the garden. There are people who stoutly maintain that the apparition was seen only a few weeks before the rectory burned. There is a part of the garden known as the nun's walk. She usually appeared from an adjoining field, stepped over a low stone wall and walked across the lawn, eventually disappearing among the trees separating the garden from the lane. There is persistent evidence of this apparition being seen by both residents of the rectory and by strangers. That isn't the writing of Price. That is the writing of Glanville. And Glanville is writing that after speaking to Ethel Bull and the other sisters. This is not the public consumption account that Price wrote in The Most Haunted House in England and the end of Borley Rectory. These are from the investigation notes that Sidney Glanville compiled for Price upon which Price drew to uh, compile the books. <clears throat> During the incumbency of the Reverend Harry Bull, there was a good deal of paranormal activity which he quite openly admitted. This is decades before Price. In nearly all parts of the house, footsteps were heard, particularly in the bedroom passages. They would reach a door, stop, and then three taps were heard, never more than three. The figure of a tall man in dark clothes was seen on many occasions. One of Reverend Harry Bull's sisters was awakened several times by a slap on her face. Now and then loud crashes were heard in different parts of the house. At this time manifestations were heard in the living rooms over the stables, which were entirely separated from the house. The groom gardener and his wife were disturbed night after night by knocks, thuds and sounds of breaking crockery. Although nothing was ever found to have been broken or even moved. They put up with these conditions for three years before leaving. There is a hard core of evidence given by reliable and intelligent persons as a result of their own experiences and observation which cannot be shaken by examination and questioning. For instance, Lady Whitehouse, who has known the rectory and its successive residents for many years, assured me, Sidney Glanville, that on a, one occasion when she was helping to nurse Mrs. Foister, she saw a medicine bottle leave the mantelpiece and float through the air, coming to rest on the floor beside the bed. Not only, she not only assured me of the complete truth of this incident and many others, but voluntarily offered to swear an affidavit confirming this to be true, if so asked. Does that sound like Harry Price was creating the, these magic tricks? Does that sound like it was the work of Price? The Smiths who called Price, who called upon the newspaper, who brought Price in, report to Glanville when being interviewed. On several occasions, the heavy shutters to the French windows in the library, which slid into cavities in the walls, were pulled sharply together. They had been in the room when this had happened. These shutters were exceptionally heavy and required considerable force to bring them together. They reach about six feet high and about three feet wide. 
It was a common thing for them to hear brass rings which are let into the wood frames and used for pulling them apart rattling. I heard this myself while sitting in the library one night. More than two, Glanville records more than 2,000 incidents, the vast majority of which Price had not, was, wasn't even in the same county, let alone the building when they were reported. Showers of keys, showers of bricks, of objects being moved and displaced, of apparitions of phantom footsteps and phantom voices. They had mysterious markings and writings appear on the wall, which Glanville records in the investigation notes, Price ordered that they be, that they be chemically examined to see if it was graphite from a pencil. Price wasn't a fool. Price was a good investigator, but Glanville was his chief investigator. And Price said, if everything else disappeared and we were left with only the locked book, we would have the true investigation. Unfortunately, thanks to Trevor Hall, that is precisely the one thing that's now gone missing. One more final thing about Hall. In his search for Harry Price, in his final book, in the book that he spent so much time for, uh, on, his cathartic 1978 book, he devotes an entire chapter to Harry Price's book plates. Now, as I said before, and as, uh, as Alan and Anne had said before me, Price did use armorials that didn't belong to him, but belonged to the Price family. We can buy them today. You can buy armorials. You may have no connection with that family, but they look good over the mantle. Price did the same with his books. Hall makes a big thing about this is a fraudulent, this is proof that Harry was prepared to commit fraud. He may have had a reason to hide his background. And Hall goes at detail through the four series of the book plates, saying that Harry had purloined books, that he'd covered um, other libraries' book plates with his. So imagine my surprise when opening my own copy of The Search for Harry Price, which has been on my bookshelf for the last four or five years, and I have read it to discover it too has a book plate hidden inside, uh, hidden by a modern dust jacket that I didn't put up. But when moving, the book plate turned out to belong to Trevor H. Hall. It said Ex Libris Trevor H. Hall. It was Trevor's own copy of his own book, The Search for Harry Price. Now, of course, you can imagine my astonishment, my shock, the wonderment that I had this man, the man that devoted his life to attacking Harry Price, and I immediately noticed the book plate. And if we can produce the book plate, this was the man who accused Price of manufacturing his armorials. We can see Trevor H. Hall, JP, because he was the Justice of the Peace. He was a magistrate. He was a fellow of the Royal Institute of Charter Surveyors. Alan Wessencraft, the curator of the Harry Price Library, points out that he claimed to have a bogus MA, that Hall never had an MA, but he put it on his book plate. But look beyond the MA, there is also a PhD. So in somewhat intrigued, I thought, well, there must be um, a record of his PhD. Dr. Trevor Hall, I mean, this was a man with an ego. He would have been Dr. Trevor Hall because... He was working alongside Dr. Eric Dingwall. Um, it wouldn't have been, you know, this is a man to whom position was important. There is no record. I, I was informed this morning that Leeds Library do have a copy of a doctoral thesis, but there is no record of it ever having been submitted. And it, it, was, it comprised basically an extended biblio bibliography of magical books and tracts uh, and so the man who wrote an entire chapter on bogus book plates certainly knew a thing about bogus book plates. This is the man who has damaged irreparably the reputation of who might, the man who may have been the greatest ghost hunter to this day. A man to whom every ghost hunter has to pay a debt of thanks. Thank you.